Hi there, I'm Chris Glover. Tonight, turning the heat up on protesters in the nation's capital. We've told them they must leave, and we have warned them the consequences of disobeying these rules. The action is in imminent. Police say they have hardened the perimeter around the demonstrators, warning them now is the time to go to leave on their own terms. Plus, freezing rain uh, will uh, materialize this evening, and then it will turn to ice pellets. The GTA getting a taste of just about everything the weather can throw at it, and we'll have a live report on what is still to come. And. You know, the beer's in the fridge, the food's in the fridges. I don't think we feel comfortable still going in. Capacity limits lift in Ontario, but are the customers ready to return? The Ottawa Police Service says its enforcement action is imminent against demonstrators who continue to block the area in front of Parliament Hill for nearly three weeks. Ashley Burke now with the police and those pushing back. More barricades going up, more warnings going out, and more police out on the streets. I'm just disturbed. I'm upset. I'm really sad for what might possibly happen today. It's an uneasy calm before police make their move and try to clear demonstrators out. We are at the end of this protest. We will take what action we need to, to deliberately, safely, lawfully end these demonstrations. Some have camped in their trucks for 21 days blocking traffic near Parliament Hill. They come to my door, I'll, I'll go peacefully. I might even give them my keys so they can drive her out instead of tow it. Today, another stern warning from the government to get out. This is no place for children. Take them home immediately. Take them to a place of safety. And we are searching. The Emergencies Act makes it illegal to bring children to unlawful demonstrations like this. The Children's Aid Society has warned parents in the event they're detained to have a plan for their kids. I haven't really thought about that, have you? <laughs> I feel perfectly safe. I don't think the police yeah. are going to do anything that's going to harm our children. Yeah. I don't think they have it in them. These two sisters have 14 children between them. They're here for the weekend to let their kids witness history. I'm not going to be stupid. You know, we're watching our kids. You know, we're keeping them close. Our kids are going to be behind us, not in front of us. <laughs> you know, but at the same time, I want to show them that we need to fight for our freedoms. And if we can do that peacefully, amen. That's why we're here. She's nine, I have five girls. And um, since all this started, I had to pull them all out of school. This mom gave her kids at home a virtual tour of the protest site. Show you the tracks. She says she doesn't want to see children who are here caught between protesters and police. That would definitely be a huge concern of mine. I would never want to see that happen. And I sure as hope the police wouldn't either. Ottawa police say their priority is ensuring children are safe. Ashley Burke, CBC News, Ottawa. Now, the House of Commons and the Senate must approve use of the Emergencies Act in order for it to come into full force for 30 days. While the NDP has offered its tentative support, the Bloc Québécois and Conservatives say they will not support it. The debate is now underway in the House of Commons, and it will continue through the weekend. We're not using the Emergencies Act to call in the military. We're not limiting people's freedom of expression. We're not limiting freedom of peaceful assembly. We're not preventing people from exercising their right to protest legally. We are, in fact, reinforcing the principles, values, and institutions that keep all Canadians free. And there are no more blockades at any borders. What's left are the trucks parked outside here in Ottawa that need to move or be moved. However, throughout the last three weeks, the Prime Minister has failed to take meaningful action to de-escalate the protests here or use any tools that he may have available. Instead, he has jumped straight to the most extreme measure. And as he has invoked the Act, he has failed to meet the high threshold set out by the Emergencies Act to justify it. The opposition does not stop there. The Canadian Civil Liberties Association has announced its intention to pursue litigation over the Emergencies Act. We are taking the Government of Canada to court. Our society needs peaceful assembly, a critical democratic tool. Disruptive protest, while often unlawful, like shutting down pipelines or camping out in a public space, can be the most effective way of raising awareness. 
The head of the association went on to say that Trudeau's emergency order was far too extreme for the situation and seriously infringes on the Charter of Rights and Freedoms. Meanwhile, a powerful storm system is moving through the greater Toronto area tonight. It started off as rain, turning into some freezing rain through the afternoon, and now snow is falling across the GTA. And meteorologist Colette Kennedy is tracking all of it for us. This is quite the roller coaster, Colette. What's up next? That's right, Chris. You know, it's kind of coming in two parts, and we're moving into that second part of this system where we get out of the icy precipitation and turn it over into snowfall which becomes heavier as we get into the later evening hours so this is a look what's happening with our current temperatures and it's really important to see this because it kind of tells you where we're seeing the various types of precipitation so still rainfall over towards Kingston two degrees above freezing we just dropped below there for Toronto at minus one and seeing that change over certainly and elsewhere it happened earlier although they did have freezing rain back to towards Windsor and towards London, as we're seeing that temperature dipping, it's becoming more of that wet snow, light at first, then getting heavier, and that will continue to intensify. And that's really what we're going to be seeing here, is just watching this intensify. And as it does, the snowfall accumulations, and most of this over by early tomorrow morning, I mean before 5 a.m., where we're looking at 15 to 25 centimeters. I've got a plus on there. Uh, we are in a snowfall warning for Toronto, and there'll be areas, especially towards the north, where I think and towards the Ottawa Valley where we're going to see 25 centimeters or more and then a prolonged period of freezing rain possible in the Niagara region also towards eastern Ontario along the St. Lawrence riverbed there so Kingston so there the actual snowfall amounts may be a little less just because there's going to be more of the ice accretion before the snow begins. So here you can see it where we get into these pinks. That's where we have the ice pellets or that freezing rain. It was drizzle at times, but it's become heavier. And if we kind of freeze this, you can see as those temperatures have fallen, we're really getting more into that wet snow. But here it is, the Niagara region around St. Catharines, where we have the prolonged icing that is certainly possible there, making for terrible driving conditions, obviously, because you get that ice and and think about this on sidewalks and on some of your side roads too and then snow on top of that so it carries on it gets heavy and we'll see the bulk of this or at least a good chunk of it 10 centimeters or more by midnight and then it continues to pile up but done like I said by early tomorrow morning behind this we get a bit of a break through the day tomorrow but some windy conditions as the winds are coming through we'll see that snow blowing around then we get a break to clean up and then another quick moving Alberta Clipper comes through but another two to maybe four or five centimeters centimeters possible that's Friday night into Saturday morning through the overnight hours so a look at some of those amounts yeah there is an area again just kind of to the north of Toronto here where we may be seeing over 25 centimeters and Chris those strong winds to go along with it so reduced visibility you got to be concerned about that too you got to stay put if you possibly can for now oof that is a lot to take in and some good advice there at the end thanks Colette storm this is just the latest one to hit the city this winter and Dale Manukduk is live tonight over the DVP at Girard Dale what are you seeing out there tonight yeah, Chris, the weather has really turned on a dime, at least where I am overlooking the DVP. At around 4.30, that rain turned into ice pellets, and then 45 minutes later, it transitioned into that light snow. So that's creating these incredibly slick conditions for drivers. But what's been really noticeable today is the flooding. There is a flood warning in effect until tomorrow. So that heavy rain and uh, above freezing temperatures throughout last night and today, that's creating some ice jams. We've seen some high waters along the Don River. Uh, the Long Branch GO station that was closed earlier today due to flooding, but it's since reopened for service. And the OPP, they've responded to at least four collisions. And here's Acting Sergeant Ed Sanchuk. And just drive according to the road and weather conditions. We need people to get home safely to their families. Uh, last year, OPP officers knocked on way too many doors when collisions could have simply been prevented by reducing your speed and paying attention to driving. Now, the West Region also has several road closures. The OPP is reminding people to not drive around those road close signs because you never know what's going to be on the opposite side. And meanwhile, the TTC, they've also had some disruptions around Castle Frank and Sherburne stations for flooding there. York University, they've canceled all night in-person classes. And Chris, Toronto Pearson International Airport are reminding travelers to check their flight status because there will be delays and even cancellations. And Dale, I know you're all over the city operations as well. How are they handling things? 
And they say it's going to be a fairly normal event for them to handle. What they learned from that record snowfall last month, Chris, was to place salt trucks strategically around the city. So they've been ready to go. It's an all hands on deck approach and 1,500 staff and every vehicle ready to be deployed. And our plows are also ready and will be deployed as soon as the snow accumulation reaches two and a half centimeters on the expressways, five centimeters on our major roads and eight centimeters on local roads. Sidewalks and bike lane plows will be deployed at two centimeters of snow accumulation. So the city's going to continue plowing throughout the night for that morning commute and throughout Friday until those roads are cleared. And Chris, a reminder to drivers to be safe out there. Mind your distance from any city crews that are doing work. And lastly, the city is still under an extreme cold weather alert. So the city's going to have additional outreach teams working to support people living outside. All of the warming centers are going to be operating at a hours. Just a relentless winter. Thanks for the update, Dale. Now to some developing news, and police say a man in his 30s was shot and killed this afternoon near Bathurst and Steeles. The victim was found inside a home around 3 o'clock, and police say a suspect was still there when officers arrived, and he was taken into custody. Investigators say they also recovered a weapon from that scene. To David and Mary Thompson Collegiate now, where it has been another difficult day for staff and students. For the first time since a student was shot and killed inside the building on Monday, the school is reopened again. Everybody's hurting. Everybody is raw and emotions are going the full gamut from I'm okay, I got this to complete, complete devastation. All the resources have uh, poured to our, our school now and we're going to make this uh, come out of this grief and uh, uh, we will come back. So teachers were welcomed back in the morning while students were allowed to return this afternoon. The TDSB says it's an opportunity for grieving students and staff to talk with a counselor, a social worker, or simply just be together. On Monday, 18-year-old student Jaheem Robinson was shot and killed inside the school near Midland and Lawrence. Investigators describe it as an execution-style attack. A 14-year-old has now been charged with murder and attempted murder in that incident. Big news now from Health Canada today, which approved another vaccine for use against COVID-19. Nivaxavid is a protein-based non-mRNA vaccine similar to the flu vaccine. In clinical trials of about 45,000 people, the overall efficacy of the Novavax vaccine against symptomatic COVID-19 was approximately 90% in individuals over 18 years of age. It was 100% effective at preventing severe disease when giving accord, given according to the authorized dosing regimen. That is two doses 21 days apart. The vaccine has already been cleared for use in Britain, Europe, Australia and Singapore. It'll be manufactured by Novavax, a new plant in Montreal. And early in the pandemic, Canada struck a deal with the U.S.-based company to buy 52 million doses. Next up, COVID capacity limits. Those are now lifted in places like restaurants, bars, and gyms right across the province. And while many businesses are desperate to get back to full tilt, as Farmarelli reports, some worry whether customers will feel safe enough to return. Inside Scotland Yard, staff prepare for a big day. The first night of full capacity in months. We've been ready. Um, you know, the beer's in the fridge, food's in the fridges. It's been a one-two punch for the pub. Not only have they been forced to close during lockdowns and operate at half capacity, they've lost significant traffic too. A large majority of our business is predicated on, you know, uh, tourism, local, domestic, people coming in from, you know, the greater GTA to come see a game, to come see a show. Here's what changes today. Capacity limits are now removed in restaurants, bars, gyms and cinemas, places where you have to show proof of vaccination. Indoor gatherings now have a limit of 50 people, outdoor 100. For nightclubs or restaurants where you can dance, they can now open to 25%. And restrictions are loosened at indoor weddings and funerals. Steve's in front, big ball, shot, scores! It's also a big day for sports fans. Scotiabank Arena goes back to 50% capacity. MLSC expects about 10,000 fans at tonight's Leafs home game. Masks will be mandatory and seats spread out. We have in observed continued improvements. The message from Ontario's top doctor today, the worst is behind us. As for easing of further restrictions, Moore says they'll review the data after March 1st. 
when vaccine passports are removed. And two weeks after that, we review any other public health measures, including masking. Uh, it, uh, if and when we transition, it would be from uh, you know, a mandate to mask uh, to a recommendation to mask. With restrictions easing, just how ready are people to go back? I'm happy that it's at full capacity. I think it's a tad too early. Um, yeah, maybe another a month or two. I think it's a great idea. People got to get back to normal. We just have to now live with the fact and, and you know, roll the punches as, as it comes. Back at Scotland Yard, there is a worry not everyone will come back. But they say they're optimistic. The hope a full-on lockdown isn't on the menu again. If we see some spikes in cases again, there needs to be a different reaction as opposed to just a shutdown. Farah Morali, CBC News, Toronto. Kids have been back in the classroom for a while now, and today the province announced new spending on learning recovery to offset the impact of remote learning. Lorenda Redekop has those details. Let's look at what it is. Can I take your The biggest amount of spending will be for tutoring, recognizing learning problems children have had during the pandemic. This is going to make a massive difference to help your children learn the gaps that have emerged over the past two years. The government is spending $175 million on that. There will be more summer school programs, much of that funding for special needs children, and money for reading programs. Plus, families can choose to continue online learning next school year. That is a strength for that small minority of children. So we're going to continue to offer it, recognizing our priority, our investments today, flow in schools. And there's some funding aimed at mental health. Too many of our students have fallen behind in their studies. And too many students have reported feelings of anxiety, sadness, and depression. These students need our help. Why now? I mean, of course, why now? It's an election year. Right? Joy Henderson so. is skeptical. She has three kids in school. She wishes extra help had come sooner. There has been ways to, you know, uh, support students who are learning online, um, but he has not really sunk any significant investment in that, let alone investments in the school buildings. The government will also bring back the standardized EQAO tests for grades three and six students this spring. That's bizarre to me. Like, why would they even like attempt to do that when these children have not had a regular school year? The government says it'll help provide a baseline for the help kids need. While there are lots of big dollar figures in this announcement, the NDP says it amounts to a cut. That's because the extra $683 million adds 2.7% to the budget, less than the rise in inflation. Lorenda Redekop, CBC News, Toronto. It is game off in Markham as officials crack down on a popular hockey spot. Here's Trevor Dunn with the residents calling the city ban un-Canadian. On a perfect afternoon for a skate or a game of shinny, the ice at Milne Pond sits empty. And it's not because of a hot chocolate break. There are now chains, gates, fences and even surveillance cameras making it all off limits. It feels kind of sad that I can't come out here and play and I have to stay inside and or go somewhere else. The barriers and signs went up last week and at least one regular rink user has even been visited by police. They had issued me um, basically uh, a trespassing warning saying that if I was to be seen out on the ice again uh, that I would be issued a trespass and that was an escalation that we hadn't seen before. Before the recent crackdown the pond was a popular spot. It froze up nicely this winter and thanks to volunteers who shoveled, flooded and measured the ice they say it was thick and perfectly safe. We do take measurements. Um, we do consult uh, charts and ice safety standards to make sure the ice is safe. Um, and then we also flood the ice as well to make it safer for skaters. But as hard as they work, Markham's rules for skating on ponds are harder to crack than a half meter of ice. It's not allowed anywhere. It's unsafe. Um, and again, we're not having the winters as we had 50, 60 years ago. City staff say that ponds collect storm water, including road salt and silt that could make the ice unstable. And the city says there are alternatives with several new rinks opening this year. Five outdoor rinks right across the city. Alternatives where people could play hockey and families can come and really enjoy it and do it in a very safe manner. For us, it was about community safety. 
There are bans on pond skating in other parts of the GTA as well, but other municipalities have also made accommodations for popular spots. Skating is now allowed on Toronto's Grenadier Pond, where the city monitors the ice level and has a flag system to let people know when it's safe to skate. Right now, Markham isn't ruling out a similar fix. Anything is a possibility, and more importantly, I will listen. We want solutions. Some hope for a future compromise, even if it's game over for now. Trevor Dunn, CBC News, Toronto.